been in Hebrews 7 pretty much the whole weekend, but let's turn back there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's actually a lot more that could be spoken about this. And in Hebrews 7, I'm going to go through and read a larger section later, but for now I'd like to for us to consider verses... 20 through 22, talking about Christ. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath, by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. I would like for us to consider this surety of a better testament. Now, when the topic for this came out, there, you know, there are some times when you, uh, the Lord has you labor and consider and pray a uh, significant amount of time before he gives you a topic. Uh, but this time, I saw the topic, and before I'd even read the other ones, I knew that was it. Because <laughs> talking about surety is really really a great thing to do uh -huh. there in the Bible we, there are things which we are absolutely sure of and which we yeah. can proclaim with no reservations with no limitations at all there are things which are absolutely sure now there are times when the Bible uses if mm -hmm. now he's he will prevent present you wholly unblameable unreprovable in his sight if he continue in the faith there's also the Lord told um, Asa, the Lord is with you while ye be with him. Mm -hmm. If ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. So there are ifs in the Bible. But you notice these ifs concern man. They don't concern God. When God does things, there's no ifs about it. And the New Testament is something which is sure because it's what God has done. Amen. And there's no ifs about the New Testament. Whether you enter into it maybe is the if. Yeah. But the New Testament is sure uh -huh. and it's never going to change. Amen. Amen. And Jesus, as the high priest, is the surety of this testament. So what is a surety? So a surety is someone who personally guarantees that a promise is going to be kept. And Amen. a surety, if someone's Amen. surety for, for money, if someone lends some money and, and one of their friends is surety for them, the, the surety is going to make sure the money gets paid, whatever happens. Now Jesus is going to make sure that the New Testament is administered, whatever happens. Jesus Amen. is the surety of the New Testament. Amen. Now some, pro, some things about a surety... A surety must be sure himself. And I think back to Genesis 43 when the children of Israel were going to Egypt to get corn because of the famine. And Joseph had told them, you have to bring Benjamin back with you next time you come. Um, and so Jacob did not want to send Benjamin, but Judah says, and Judah said unto his father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou and our little ones. I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him, if I bring him not unto thee, and set him before thee. Then let me bear the blame forever. And this is what a surety does. It says, I'm, takes responsibility for making sure a promise is kept. But, however... Judah actually couldn't keep Joseph from taking Benjamin. The, when, when Joseph sent the, the cup back in Benjamin's sack, there was nothing Judah could do about that. Mm -hmm. Joseph could have taken Benjamin however he wanted. So from that we see that a surety, to ensure something, you have to be have the power to enforce it okay. yourself. Now, David understood what a good surety was when he said, Be surety for thy servant for good. 
So the only things which are sure are the things which God assures. Amen. And we see that God is going to assure this New Testament, this better testament. In Psalm 110, we've read the fourth verse, but from verse 1 it says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauty of holiness from the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now we've seen that Christ is a priest. We've seen that God has sworn this. But if we look in the first three verses, we see who this is that God has sworn to. This is someone who is sitting at God's right hand. This is someone who has overcome. This is someone who has the rod of his strength going forth. Now this is someone who can be a surety of a better testament. Mm -hmm. Because this is someone with all power given to him in heaven and in earth. So Jesus really is the only one who can qualify to be a surety for this testament. Amen. Because only he himself has the authority and the power to enforce what he has desired. Amen. Yes, and now, before we get into this, I'd like for us to consider the question of why we have to have a surety for a better testament. Mm -hmm. Why couldn't God have just given this new testament and leave us to... To hope that it's sure. Well, the the problem is there is no confidence in that in that way of dealing. God wanted confidence in this New Testament. In fact, it's absolutely essential that there be confidence in Amen. the New Testament. Amen. How important is this to God? Well, important enough that God would swear an oath mm -hmm. to His Son to make it sure. Now, he could have just said it, he could have promised it, but he put forth the effort to swear an oath to make this extra sure so we would know, because it's absolutely essential that we know that the New Testament is sure. Mm -hmm. And why is this? It's because the New Testament essentially involves us drawing nigh to God. Amen. Yeah. Now, in Exodus 19, the Lord is appearing to the, to the children of Israel. He's going to give them the Ten Commandments. And this is the description of the God that we are approaching. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people in the camp trembled. Every single person in this camp of Israel was trembling yeah. right. at the sound and at the sights of this. Yeah. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke. Because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. And the voice of the... And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. Now, God has not changed since he appeared on Mount Sinai. And this was actually a very much limited appearance of God. And so, in order to, to approach God, this is no small matter. Now, like to consider this thought of knowledge and boldness. Now, if you have no knowledge of God, it's easy to be bold before him. As Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Now, Pharaoh was not afraid of the Lord, but by his own proclamation, he did not know the Lord. Now, on the other hand, if you do know who he is, it is very hard to be bold before him. You know, because if you see that God is this consuming fire, then to come before him with confidence, 
That's no small matter. Right. And in fact, if neither of these conditions will bring men close to God as he desires. Knowledge without, without boldness causes men to draw back. And no knowledge causes men to be destroyed as Pharaoh was. But in the New Testament, God wants both knowledge and boldness. He, he said that they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord. In the New Testament, everyone knows God. And also, though, we are of his house if we hold fast the confidence. So these two things must be met. We must know God and we must also have confidence and boldness before him. And that's why we needed a great high priest. Mm -hmm. So that we so he he himself actually provides the knowledge of God. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. And also he is the surety which allows us to be confident that our that our sins have been forgiven, that we can approach to him. So our high priest ministers to both these things. And this is why it's necessary that he is a surety, because that's what's going to allow us to draw near to God. Amen. That's what's going to allow us to, ha to have boldness before a holy God. Amen. So the New Testament is based on faith, and our faith has to have something sure to lay hold on. And the things that we can't be called to do in the New Testament simply cannot be done without boldness, and without Amen. confidence, and without assurance that Christ has forgiven our sins. Amen. Amen. Some phrases from Hebrews 10. Boldness to enter into the holiest. Mm -hmm. These, this is what we're called to do in the New Covenant. Let us draw near yeah. with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Amen. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Now, could we enter the holiest without, with, with boldness if we weren't really sure if the New Testament was in effect? No, not at all. Not at all. We couldn't hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering unless we have something sure, something that assures the new covenant, something that assures what our faith is in. And that is why we needed a surety. That's why Christ himself had to be the surety, because it was so important that we have confidence. Amen. Now, going back to, to, Hebrews, to Hebrews 7, back a few verses here. And think about uh, the manner in which Christ is surety for a better testament. Now, I'm going to start reading from verse 11 and try to, try to follow the argument and the reasoning that the Holy Spirit is using in this. Hebrews 7, 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? So this is talking about the, the word in the Psalms that Christ would be after the order of Melchizedek. So if the Levitical priesthood were all there was, then, then we would need, we'd not need a new order. And then verse 12 I think is key. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Mm -hmm. So just get this down, that if there's a new priesthood, uh -huh. then there has to be a new law. There was no allowance in the Levitical law for a Melchizedek <laughs> order of priesthood. Amen. Amen. So, verse 13, For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So this is, this is a new order of priesthood. And it, it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, 
but after the power of an endless life. So Christ could not have been made by this carnal law. Christ had to be made by another, another proclamation of God. For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there verily is a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. So in Christ, in Christ being a priest after the order of Melchizedek, that necessarily means to us that the old covenant has been disannulled, that this old law has been overridden by a new testament. So in this way, we the very fact that Christ is a priest after the order of Melchizedek shows to us that the old testament, the old law, has been has been made old, and we're moving on to the new. Amen. Because there's no way for this law to be in effect and Christ to be priest. They didn't say anything about a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So that is that is a way in which Jesus is surety of a better testament. By him being priest, mm -hmm. there must be a better testament in effect right now. So in that he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So in the same way, he's a new priesthood he's made the first old so if, if you're concerned about whether we're still under the law it's been made old because we have a new priesthood now in even more than that though there is this word of the oath which has made sure the new testament now this is a communication between the Father and the Son. And so this is something we want to give extra attention to. This is something very, very important. Because this is the Father, and this is the Father swearing to the Son with an oath. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Amen. So God makes oaths when he wants to give us abundant assurance of the truth. Now, not not because God's promise is not sure, right. but because this is something which is so essential for us. It's so essential that the New Testament is assured to us that God has made an oath to, for the infirmity of our flesh to, to help our faith in this matter. Now, God's oath is sure. Amen. Yes. And really, there's no way that Christ has ever failed to obtain a promise of God. So by the word of the oath, Christ is confirmed as a high priest under this New Testament. Mm -hmm. So as Christ being our, our high priest, he confirms that we are under this New Testament. Mm -hmm. this, also, this word of the oath also confirms to us God's God's attitude toward his son and his son's work. This shows God's approval of Christ, which is absolutely essential that we know and understand this. It says in Isaiah 53 that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. God is satisfied with Christ. Amen. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Amen. And so God's 
pleasure at Christ's work has been shown when he raised him from the dead and when he exalted him to this high position, given him a name which is above every name. So God's pleasure with, God, with Christ's sacrifice for sin is shown by God swearing that he would be a high priest, giving them this high authority. This shows God's approval of Christ Amen. by the oath that which...